So today we will uh, finally start with something new, and that is the topic of bundles. Chapter two. So the bu bundles will be the main topic of um, this course, at least of the first half of the course before we move on to sheaves. Uh, but of course, the two are very um, intimately connected. So we'll begin with a definition, which is the definition of submersion. So we start with E and M manifold. And we take a projection, I mean, map by just map, which is smooth. And again, when I write uh, manifolds, I mean uh, smooth manifolds. And then you should think that this always also works for complex manifolds. And every time I say smooth, you should replace it with holomorphic. Okay, so we take this map and we say that the triple made of the two manifolds and the map is a submersion. If it is subjective, if 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 that's a if pi is subjective, if pi subjective, and the differential of this map, which is defined as a map from the tangent space of E to the tangent space of M at a specific point, which in this case is pi of P, is also surjective. For all P. Okay, so we're just saying uh, that the pi is surjective and also is differentially surjective of every point. And um, now let us define what uh, vibration is. So we take F to be another manifold. Manifold. And a vibration, vibration with fiber F, that's why it's called F. Is a submersion E and phi uh, with some additional property, and that is for every point in M, in M there exists a neighborhood of M of uh, X, sorry, so open neighborhood of M and the diffeomorphism. from the empty image of you to u times f diffeomorphism such that if we define for e x the uh, this to be the fiber over one single point then the map phi which is what this is morphism restrict, restricted to EX. So that from EX to X times F is also this morphism. Um, so what we're saying here is that, okay, you have this submersion and over every point, um, so the anti image, this by inverse of x is ex, each one of them is diffeomorphic to this fiber f. So basically over every point you have the same thing, which is this f. Uh, but not just that, this, this also like varies diffeomorphically. So, okay, sure, over every point you have this nice uh, fiber f, but this equivalent is kind of um, smooth when you uh, vary your base point x. This is what this part is saying. 
this uh, fact that this diffeomorphism is not only over each fiber, but is actually over an open set. And uh, to give some names, so names, E is the total space of the federation. M is the base of the federation. And F, of course, is the fiber. Okay. And um, you can try to imagine from the implicit function theorem or inverse function theorem that uh, every time you have a submersion, then you automatically have a vibration. Uh, that is not the case. It's almost the case. Uh, but not exactly. We'll give an example, a better counterexample of something uh, which say as a submersion, which is not a vibration. So take any vibration. So this is an actual vibration. Vibration with fiber F. And um, then take a point in the vibration, in the total space. And now if we restrict pi from E minus this point, M is still a submersion. but not a vibration. And maybe if you want to be pedantic here, you want to say that this is not just a singleton. Um, okay, so let's see for a second why this is the case. I'm just going to say it. Uh, so the idea, what a vibration has, which is, ex which is extra than being just a submersion is the fact that over every point, the fiber is the same. So if you just remove a point here, uh, you see that over, over pi of p, why not? Over pi of p, yeah, so you have a point, Pi of p in M, uh, the inverse image of this new object, so this restricted one, of pi of p is not diffeomorphic to f. Yeah, it's diffeomorphic to f minus a point, it's going to f minus this point p, uh, so we don't satisfy the definition of vibration. But of course, it's still a submersion uh, because it's surjective. And okay, to be precise, to make sure that it's surjective, you have to say that this fiber is not a single point, because maybe here we remove our fiber and we're missing something, we're missing this five p. But if this is not just a single point, um, then this map is still surjective. And of course, uh, the um, fact that also the differential is surjective uh, still holds. So the differential is simply the same. It doesn't matter that you remove the point. So this is uh, the definition of vibration. And now we have a special class of vibrations, which are bundles. We take G, the Lie group. And a vibration, E, M, F, Pi. Yeah, so this means that E and Pi is um, submersion. And with that, you have a vibration. Immersion is a bundle with structure group G. Group G. 
if we have two conditions, G acts effectively, effectively on F. So this means we have an action of G on, on this uh, fiber F. And uh, effectively, I, re I recall we did it last week, uh, means that the map from G into the automorphous group of F is injected. And furthermore, there exists a covering, uh, covering, open covering, U alpha, oh, M, such that for every alpha, we have diffeomorphisms, three alpha, from um, pi inverse of U alpha into U alpha times F, which, okay, this is this, the existence of this diffeomorphism. It's uh, still part of the definition of vibration. Uh, but now we have an extra condition such that for u alpha intersected u beta non empty, there exists some g alpha beta from u alpha intersected u beta into g, and this is where our group comes into play. And this needs to be smooth. If this is a homomorphic and G is a complex group, we will talk about uh, complex bundle first. And this satisfies that it's fine. Uh, this composition law, so phi alpha composed phi beta inverse. So this is now <clears throat> a map from uh, U alpha intersected U beta times that into U alpha intersected U beta times F. So we take X and F, and this is equal to X itself times this G alpha beta of X times F. And when we write it in this way, remember the G alpha beta of X is an element of G, so we fix the X. And G acts on F. So this is what we mean here by this writing is the action of G on F. Okay. And this is for F and X in U alpha intersected U beta. And uh, again, here we have some names. U alpha is the trivializing atlas. The yeah. atlas for the bundle and the G alpha betas are the so-called local transition transition function. Transition function. And uh, yeah, we'll sometimes just drop local uh, and just say the transition functions. Okay, so let's just review this definition for a second. Um, so we have basically a vibration, uh, but then we have this extra thing, which is this uh, group G. And what we're saying is that, so in a, when we define vibration, we have this, uh, basically local trivialization yeah so over you have this neighborhood and, and um, each of these neighborhoods so the empty image of each of these neighborhoods looks like this u times f which is these are different morphisms so this is true here uh, but what it's telling you is that you have something extra which is that you kind of know how to move from uh, one u alpha to another u beta and this moving happens via this G action. Okay. And we will see more in details what I mean from moving from one to the other. And uh, if you look at the definition of this uh, G alpha beta, so this phi alpha composed phi beta inverse, uh, you realize the following observation the transition function. Transition functions satisfy following g alpha alpha is nothing but the identity 
position on the alpha. That is just phi alpha composed. So you take phi alpha composed phi alpha inverse and you just get x and f. Oh, sorry, I change font for this f. And um, so this is just, means that G alphabet is just identity. Yeah, the identity in G, so the identity element in G, because the action was um, effective or faithful. Uh, if you multiply G alpha beta times G beta alpha, so maybe. So this is a multiplication in G. So these are two elements in G for fixed X. So these are two elements uh, in G, G alpha beta of X is in G, G beta alpha of X is in G. Uh, and if you multiply them together, again, you get the density element in G. Yeah, the neutral element. And again, you can just see because it's phi alpha composed phi beta inverse composed phi beta composed phi alpha inverse. So you just get the density. And you can even do it with three indices. So G alpha beta right, times G beta gamma right, times G gamma alpha right, also this is the density. Of course, provided this intersection is not empty. So again, these are just three elements of G. You multiply them together, you get the identity, and again, you can just see it from right here. So these three together are called the uh, co-cycle conditions. Co condition. And we'll see there actually what determines the bundle. Uh, this map, uh, this G alpha beta, this local transfer function are what determine the bundle together with the fiber. Uh, but before we do that, of course, we'll see usually when we do things to define the bundle, there is always this up to isomorphism. So we have to say what is an isomorphism of bundles. Does it fit here? Probably. So let's take two manifolds, M and M prime. And let's take two distinct bundles by E in M and by E prime from E prime to M prime bundles. Uh, sometimes they're called just bundles, sometimes they're called fiber bundles. So I might just say fiber bundles sometimes. And I want to define what is a morphism between these two objects. So a morphism of bundles of bundles is a pair by F such that. So F is at the level of the manifold. And phi is at the level of the total spaces. Take space. These are both smooth, such that phi prime composed phi is the same as f composed phi e. Okay, so this basically means that the correct diagram commutes. Yeah, so you put e e prime. E prime, M prime, M. It means this commutes. Okay, this condition. And uh, if uh, F and phi are diffeomorphisms, diffeomorphisms, the bundles are equivalent.
Yeah. So, so we have these two vibrations, so these two bundles, and we say that this is a morphism if simply the natural diagram commutes. And of course, if both these two arrows, so this F and phi arrow, are different morphisms, then we just say that the two bundles are equivalent. So pretty natural definition. Uh, also, I want to introduce also another name. So if we take you continue and open, we say that the bundle E, bundle E is trivial over you. If uh, oh, if we just look at the fiber over uh, you, so I write it like this, and by this I mean the empty image of you, by pi, is equivalent to you and F. So if we go back to our uh, definition of bundle, there it is. What we're saying is that there exists a, a, um, a covering U alpha such that uh, um, the bundle E is trivial over U alpha or every alpha. And then we have this also addition with this uh, G alpha beta. So if we think back about the definition of vibration, we can say that a vibration just a submersion, which is local material. Okay, um, so I want to dwell a bit more with this definition of, um, of a morphism and uh, what it means. So, position. Let's start with a manifold. And we take E bundle of M with fiber F. and structure group G. And we take this U alpha, so this pairs U alpha, C alpha E, uh, trivializing atlas. Atlas for E. Uh, so maybe here I stop for a second and uh, uh, give a warning. We call this trivializing atlas, but this is not an atlas in the sense of manifold. Huh? So this is not an atlas for M, this is not an atlas for E. It's a trivializing atlas for the bundle. So this phi alpha E, you know, we go from uh, pi inverse of alpha to, to alpha and F. So we have this trivializing atlas for E. And uh, we also give an nature decision function with transition functions G alpha beta. Okay. And then we take another bundle again over M, so over the same manifold M. Uh, different fiber, different uh, um, structure group, fiber F prime, structure group G prime, uh, local trivializations, trivial, analyzing atlas. Uh, made with the same open sets, but of course you have different transition functions, which you call the alpha E prime and transition, transition functions. Uh, 
H. Alpha, beta. Okay, so let's just review the setup for a second. Uh, no, not yet. Just uh, conclude the proposition and then we'll review what this all means before proceeding to the proof. So a map psi from E into E prime is an equivalent. If it's an equivalent if or all alpha. Posing C alpha to be by definition C alpha E prime composed C composed C E alpha inverse, and we write it with the two components C prime alpha and C second alpha, and this you see is a map from. Uh, u alpha times f into u alpha times f prime. We have that c alpha prime is a density. So we need a density map from u alpha to u alpha. And if u alpha intersected u beta is non empty, then The things match well, meaning that uh, if you just look at the second component, we'll see beta second of x t. So x is an element of the alpha and t is an element of f. Uh, this is the same in h beta alpha of x times p second of p second alpha of x and g alpha beta of x. Okay, so this is the action, and this is also the action. And we'll call this formula here star, let's give it a name. And vice versa. This is a very long proposition, so just write all of it and then we'll stop to think about what it means. Vice versa, if there exists a family. Of maps psi alpha of the form identity psi second alpha of smooth maps. And if psi alpha are from u alpha times f into u alpha times f prime, such that. I alpha second, uh, sorry, yeah, second from, no, just say alpha, say alpha uh, for fixed X and dot of X times F goes into X times F prime. So uh, I hope you know what this means with this dot. So it's here we're fixing X. And we consider the map that takes a point F, um, something in F, and sends it to um, C alpha of X, comma F. So if, if this, if there is a then that satisfies, satisfies star. Condition star, so this one. Then there exists 
a bundle equivalent. Equivalent phi. So from uh, E to E prime, such that C alpha for, for this yeah, is exactly C alpha E prime composed C composed C alpha E to the negative one for every one. Okay, so we have this two page proposition kind of thing. Um, so let's uh, break it down slowly. So this part on the left is kind of a thunder setup. We have a manifold. We have two different bundles over this manifold. One we call E, one we call E prime, and we also give name to the fiber F prime to the structure group G, G prime. And uh, we fix the trivializing atlas. Uh, and here we have U alpha, C alpha E, and here we have U alpha, C alpha. Uh, e prime. And um, here I want to just say that in principle, of course, this U alpha should not, don't have to be the same, uh, but we can just assume that they're the same up to the strict thing. Now, if here you had the U alpha and here you had V alpha, then you take U alpha intersected V alpha for all possible alphas. And this would give you just the same. Uh, open sets here, so it's not restrictive. So it's considered that here we have the same open sets. And so now that we have a trivializing atlas, this also gives our transition function. So G alpha beta is, map, is a map from U alpha intersected U beta into G, and H alpha beta is a map from U alpha intersected U beta into G prime. Okay, so we defined uh, what is an equivalence of uh, bundles. And uh, this whole proposition is telling you how to interpret this um, equivalence locally. So you can think of this phi alpha as a local expression of your phi, because you're, you're taking your uh, local trivialization, so your phi alpha e inverse. And this goes from, so I think now it's time to make the drawing. So here we have our u alpha and f. Here we have our u beta and f. And here we have the transition function g alpha beta. Uh, of course, this is not exactly like this. You know, g alpha beta only acts on the second component. Uh, so this is this g alpha beta is not really a map from u beta times f to u alpha times f. Uh, but for schematics, um, this is very helpful. To think about it like this. And here, of course, you can uh, go down to, well, on one side you can go to u alpha, and on the other side you can go to u beta, and then, of course, you have an intersection, and that's where all of this, uh, for instance, that's where the relationship star takes place on u alpha intersected u beta. And uh, so this is for the first bundle, so this is all for E. And then you have the same exact picture on the other side for u prime, so h alpha beta, u beta prime, and here you have the same u alpha and the same u beta. And um, and then you have this map, which is this psi, yeah, that really goes from E to E prime. But what we want to know is how does this map phi, psi look when you restrict it here on your alpha times f. So this is your psi alpha. And of course, you also have your psi beta. Let me change color, psi beta. So you alpha is the restriction of p basically to this realization, c beta the restriction of c to this realization. But of course you want that this all diagram commutes. 
and uh, this co condition star is precisely that condition telling you that you can go this way and then take sleep it and then come back or you know everything is the same because it comes from just one single map which is the psi okay so this is what it's telling you and it, and it works both ways so in the sense if you have a psi so if you have a psi then this phi alpha beta behave as they should behave which is this condition star and vice versa if you have this phi alpha beta which behave as they should so behave in a way that you get this community diagram uh, then you can glue them together to one unique psi such that the, the local expression of the psi is precisely this given psi alpha, psi theta. Is there any question about this before I proceed with the proof? No, thank you. Okay. I'm actually going to delete this drawing. And so proof. Proof is actually not that hard because uh, you just have to chase these diagrams. So let's start with X and T in new alpha and F. And now let's consider uh, this map. So this map is Psi alpha, but we take it step by step. So Psi alpha was defined uh, um, as a composition. So here we have the alpha E inverse so here we go into pi inverse e of u alpha so this is a subset of e then we apply c so this is just how psi alpha was defined so now you look at the so this is an element of uh, not an element but an open subset of uh, e prime and here we take the other local optimization phi alpha e prime and this goes in your and f prime. Okay, this is just the definition. Uh, so what does this mean? So of course, instead of uh, alpha, we can use beta. So phi beta was defined as psi beta e prime composed psi composed psi e beta inverse. Uh, now we will uh, stick some uh, phi alpha, phi alpha inverse in between. What I mean by this, we just do c beta e prime composed c alpha e prime inverse composed c alpha e prime. So you see these two cancel out. So I can just put them there, and I'll do the same on the other side. Phi alpha. E inverse composed the alpha E composed the beta E inverse. Okay, so now let's slow down again. So I just put in this identity. Yeah, this is identity, this is identity. And now if you look at this, this is nothing about the alpha. Yeah. And well, this ones are uh, basically the identity on the first component well in the second component uh, this is the transition function for h so this is h beta alpha so the convention here is that the one you start from is on the right so you're going from alpha to beta so you write beta alpha which notice is the opposite of what we did for the transition functions on a manifold yeah that was the opposite And here we have identity of G alpha beta. Okay. And yeah, I hope it's okay when I write like this. So what it means is that if you apply it to X comma F, then here becomes X comma G alpha beta of X times F. And the times is just the action. Okay, so in particular, if you look at the second component, the second beta is just the H beta alpha times C second alpha times 
just for that time. Okay, which is basically star, just by inputting uh, the symbol, the X and FD. Okay. And we have this next condition. And uh, maybe let's look about this condition for a moment. It's really good. So this is a function which lives on new beta. And here is telling you that, okay, we start from new beta, you go to alpha, you apply the function that lives on your alpha, and then you go back to beta. And that's, that's how I feel about this formula. And it's telling you that doing these things the same, which is basically saying that there is some diagram, which is the one we drew before, that commutes. Okay, so this is for the first direction. So now let's look at the vice versa. So this first direction is saying that we have a C and uh, then this Psi alpha just come and they respect position to spec. So this condition star. And vice versa, well, we have to define uh, our C given this Psi alpha which respects these star conditions. And it's pretty easy, you just say C of e, e is just an element of e, would be c e inverse, e prime inverse, compose c alpha, compose c of e of e. Um, so I think this again makes sense because the, the condition, I mean, the, the way we define the, our c alpha is yeah, it's like this, so you just put everything on the other side, and this should work, right? Because if this doesn't work, well, then you cannot have this, right? And uh, the exercise, it shows that it works. And in particular, the, so what you really have to prove is verify that it is well defined. Because uh, the problem, of course, is this pi e of e is in both u alpha and u beta, then you have two conflicting definitions. And you just have to show that that they actually produce the same result. And of course, you will have to use this uh, condition start to do that. So this is to show it's well defined. And also you have to show that it is an equivalent concentration. Okay, um, so I think this somewhat gives us shows the importance of uh, of transition functions because basically every time you have a map between bundles, um, a morphism between bundle, you will have uh, this star relationship between the localization yeah, of this and. Um, In fact, the next theorem tells us that, uh, actually, maybe before the theorem, I want to say it by words, before stating the theorem explicitly, I want to just say it by words, is that up to equivalence, equivalence, so equivalence in the sense of uh, bundles, equivalence, a fiber bundle. is defined by its transition function. Yeah, so the next theorem will show that if you have two bundles which have the same fiber and same transition functions, then they're actually the same bundle.
or at least their equivalent. So we start with two manifolds and we take a lead group. which acts on F. And we take an open cover. Of M. With map. G on the beta. Well, you fit into G. Uh, whenever, of course, we need the, uh, the intersection to be non empty. Uh, such that uh, they satisfy satisfying the ecocycle condition. So, okay, let's uh, review the hypothesis. These are the hypothesis. Um, okay, so this map, so I'm saying that Tiger bundle is defined by its transition function, but for something to be even, I have a hope to be called a transition function is to satisfy the cycle conditions, which were this condition back here. Yeah, this green condition. So if you have some collection of maps, which uh, satisfies this, then, there exists a unique of the equivalence bundle E with base M fiber F F structure group G and of course transition function uh, just beta. So yeah, this is what I was trying to say before is that if you are given some fibers and um, some transition functions, then there is just one bundle, which I precisely does. So let's prove this. Okay, so how would you define this bundle? So the idea is just define something and then prove that it has all these properties. And um, you define it as the disjoint union of your alpha and F, which is like your local realization. And then you make a quotient. And if you remember, this is very similar to something we did with manifolds. Uh, you know, you just imagine this U alpha times F as patches, they're just there. And then somehow you have to glue them together. And uh, the transition function tells you exactly how you should glue them together. Okay, so this is what I meant before, uh, some 30 minutes ago, when I say that this G alpha beta tells you how to transition from one um, local realization to another. Because this is how you glue these patches together. So, what do I mean by glue? So, let's explicitate this uh, <clears throat> um, equivalent relation. You say that X F is equivalent <clears throat> is equivalent to um, Y F prime. If and only if there exists alpha and beta such that X is in your alpha, Y is in your beta, X is equal to Y, so they're, they're really the same element. And F is what well, should be, so there is G alpha beta of X. So we can imagine this Y F prime as somewhere as something in U beta times F, and this X F as something U alpha times F, and therefore they should mean like this. Okay. 
to do this? What do we need to do to show that this is in fact this unique bundle uh, with these properties? So we have to show one uh, that this is an equivalent relationship. Equivalent relation. So the, this map pi is continuous. That there exists a local periodization. Local periodization with, with this uh, uh, transition function. G alpha beta transition function. And then, of course, one thing which maybe is easy to forget, we have to show that E is a manifold. That's also a part of the definition of bundle. You need the total space to be a manifold. Um, 30 new page? No, okay. Number one, we can prove it here. And this is just co cycle condition. Co cycle condition. Because, uh, okay, what does it mean to be an equivalence relationship? An equivalence relation, uh, okay, you need that X is in relationship with X, and this is given by this. Then you need that if X is in relationship with Y, then Y is in relationship with X, and this is given by this. And then you need the transitive property, so if X is in relation to Y, which is in relation to Z, then X is in relation to Z, and this is given by this. Okay, so you really see that this now transfer to the three axioms of an equivalence relation. So, no. Now, for number two, we have to show that uh, <clears throat> um, that there exists this pi, and we have to define this uh, pi. So we define it pi of the equivalence class x f is just x, and this is well defined. Um, because any other uh, thing which is equivalent to uh, the pair xf has the same x, find, and of course it's also continuous. Obviously, to change x a bit changes correspondingly. And for three, back we have to show that this um, that we have this local periodization. So here we define by alpha as you imagine, so by inverse of u alpha into u alpha times f. So these are equivalent classes, x builds up, builds up, and we send it to x f. And what is this x f? Where x f is the unique. Representative of uh, X tilde S tilde in U uh, alpha and F uh, thought of it as a subset of this joint unit. Okay, and could, could this pi alpha, pi inverse of U alpha, of course, is a uh, contains, among other things, u alpha times f, yeah, uh, before we apply this uh, equivalence relationship, and um, contains only once, and since there's only one representative, so we take that one. Okay, so we have to show that this, in fact, is uh, adjective and uh, uh, homomorphic. Uh, so bijectivity is easy, so it's adjective. Uh, because the inverse, inverse is simply wrong, restricted to u alpha and f. But what is this wrong? Oh, where? Uh, rho is simply the quotient map from this, this joint union. Yeah, it's just a quotient map.
And um, yeah, I hope you can see that this is uh, in fact uh, the inverse. Yeah, uh, you know, this is the unique representative. So when you take XF and you take the equivalence class of XF, this is precisely the inverse. And uh, why is it an homeomorphism? So phi alpha is an homeomorphism. Uh, because, because it's very easy to see that C is restricted to your alpha and that is open. Okay, so this is the bijective map, which is continuous. And I mean, think of the uh, row U alpha and that as a map which is continuous, bijective, and open. Uh, so the inverse is also continuous, therefore, it's an homomorphism. And why is this uh, an open map? Well, think of um, an open set in here. Uh, well, the image is something in E. And uh, being this a quotient, this is open if and only if the anti image is open. Uh, but the anti image of that is basically uh, a collection of. So we want to show that uh, P of your and F of V is open or V open. Um, but this is true if and only if the anti image, yeah, this row inverse, because this is a portion map of the row of your alpha and F of V is open. Uh, but this you can think. Uh, this joint union of like u so over beta of u beta times f intersected this uh, g beta alpha of v if it makes sense so this is not g beta alpha it's like um, the old transition map uh, but usually we just simplify it like this and uh, G beta alpha is a uh, isomorphism. So this is an open set. So this is just intersection of open sets. This is a union of open sets. So this is open. Okay, this is a bit sketchy. I understand it. If you don't uh, understand, just tell me and we'll do it more carefully. Okay. And of course, the last thing we have to do is prove that E is manifold. And this is yeah, a bit longer than mine, so let's get to the next page. But it is pretty straightforward, I would say. So the first thing we can do is assume that Uh, it's uh, U alpha are actually um, an atlas atlas for M. So this is an atlas as a manifold. So this assume part is about this U alpha, because so this U alpha that we took in principle were just uh, an open covering of M, which basically in the end uh, we see it's a uh, trivializing atlas for the bundle E. But if we just uh, restrict them a bit, we can also assume that this is an actual atlas for M. So the U alpha for an atlas and this psi alpha is just the uh, uh, local maps. The local triangulation. Okay, so we have uh, this atlas, and now let's also fix an atlas for F. So we take W and J, theta J, F. And why do I care about this? Well, because uh, this E, this E. Is basically some mixture of M and F. 
so the atlas will need to come somehow from a mixture of the atlases of M and X. In fact, we see that uh, if we take the equivalence classes of this U alpha times WJ, and here we vary alpha and J, this is an open cover. So this uh, square parentheses mean uh, rho of the alpha times wj, yeah. So okay, this is clearly an open cover because everything is one of this, because these are covers of m and f respectively. And we define phi tilde of the alpha j so this is a map which goes from u alpha times wj the equivalence class into phi alpha u alpha times pj of wj and you see this is a subset of some rm because this is a subset of some rn and this is a subset of some rk so this will in fact be our uh, local chart for e which in the end will prove that e is a manifold which is what we're doing right now so, and what do we do? We take an equivalence class here, and well, we do what we expect us to do. Just for this. And of course, we have the usual problem, uh, which is to. Oh, we don't. We don't have to show that this is uh, well defined, because uh, we take this. This here, we take the representative in your alpha times. Wj, so this is well defined. But what we need to show is that show that the transition to smoothness. So if you compose two of this, should be smooth. Because again, this is the definition of smooth manifold. You need this transition mass. Okay, and this is the uh, imputation. Let me take actually a little bit more space. Let uh, we take a pair, TT, and we take it in this intersection product. Okay, so this is uh, basically the correct domain and we just compute so we have phi alpha j tilde compose tilde beta k inverse of p t okay so this is phi tilde alpha j of what of phi beta inverse of p and here we have phi inverse uh, theta k inverse of t. Okay, it's just definition. Um, but of course, so this these representatives now are in like u beta times w k. Uh, but to apply this phi alpha j, we need to find the correct representative in u alpha times w j. And uh, so we just modify what's inside here. And the first term just stays the same because we know that the equivalence doesn't do anything to the first one. Uh, but on the second one, we have to uh, somehow transition to our uh, u alpha times wj. And to do that, just apply g alpha beta at the point phi inverse beta of p applied. So this is an element of g, and we're applying it. Okay, so this looks like a lot of things, so why these two should be equivalent, but simply think of this as something over uh, u beta, yeah, and you need to move it over u alpha, and that's really the only way to do it. You have to apply g alpha beta, and the point, well, it's just the point that you're given. Okay, okay so now we're ready to apply our g alpha. 
PTL delta J. So let's do that. The definition this is psi alpha compose the beta inverse. Which you're kind of happy about because it's just the transition function for m. And well, here we have phi j of g alpha beta applied at the point phi beta inverse of p. Again, I'm to die k inverse of p. And that's it. Okay, now we just have to see. So, this is the map, this is an expression for this map. Uh, we have to see this is in fact smooth. Change color. Uh -huh. Okay. So this is smooth because okay, as we say, uh, it's smooth because transition for M. Yeah, this is just the transition functions for M. So it okay, smooth P. Uh, but what about this? This is a bit more complicated because, sure, you can say that like pj composed the pk inverse or the transition function for uh, f, but then you have this thing in the way. So it's a uh, composition of functions, and we kind of appreciate that all of that are uh, smooth, not only respect to p, but with respect to p as well. So in this term here, So it's uh, so we, we do it separately. Uh, so smoothness with respect to t. So smooth with respect to t. T is going to be in theta k of w k. And this is because um, the action. So this this thing. Of, so now we're fixing t. Yeah. We're, you know that to show that something is moved with respect to two variables is equivalent to say that it's moved with respect to one and to the other. Um, <clears throat> so if we fix P, this is just an element of G, and we know that the action is smooth because the G action is smooth. And otherwise, we just have some transition function for F. Smooth. And the transition functions for F are smooth. Okay, so this is this takes care of um, smoothness with respect to P. What about smoothness with respect to P? Another color. So again, this is only for the second component because the first component is easy. Um, well, we have that uh, phi beta inverse is smooth. The uh, the map G alpha beta, if you see it as a map from um, U alpha intersected U beta. Into G is also smooth. Yeah. So this is simply a composition of smooth maps. You take P, you send it, you use something smooth to it, and then you use again something smooth to it. Um, so this is also smooth in P. And as we said, this action then, this smooth map with respect to P acts smoothly on something which depends smoothly with respect to T. And everything works just fine. So this produces our unique of the equivalent uh, bundle with this given transition function. Okay. So this is iterate again, uh, given uh, some unit transition function and some fiber and some yeah, given action on these fibers, then there exists the just one bundle of the equivalent with this given transition function. And what we did just now was the proof, which I think is rather natural. There is really only one way to try to go about that. And what we see is that this way actually works. Any questions so far? Thank you. 
Okay. So far, everything is good. Okay, so now that we have this general notion of bundles, we can move on to some more specific bundles. Oh. Oh, I can write the title with purple. Vector bundles, vector and principal bundles. So the, what we spoke about so far, just the general notion of bundles, which you can think about when you can think that this fiber is really any, this fiber F is just manifold, and you know how to move from one local realization to another. But let's define what is a vector bundle. So if you're given a bundle with fiber RK, R to the K, with for some natural number K, and the structure group, structure group is GLKR, is a vector bundle of rank K. I will often skip this of rank K, this parenthesis. If there exists a trivializing atlas, the trivializing atlas, uh, U alpha, C alpha for E, such that for every X in U alpha and C alpha restricted to EX. X into times k is a vector space isomorphism. Is a vector space so we're not only asking that our vector bundle as rk as a fiber and glk as a structure group but we're really asking that each of these fibers is actually it's isomorphic to rk not just as a manifold which would be just the case of a bundle with fiber rk and structures of glk but they're really isomorphic as vector spaces okay so not just uh, as manifolds but really as vector spaces um you might think oh well but i can just kind of cheat and say that you know, I have a bundle and the fiber is a K and the structure group is GLK. So at least I have a, an isomorphism here as a, sorry, um, a different morphism. And then I can just say that this EX is a vector space by using this different morphism, you know? Or you define the addition here, well, you go here, you take the addition in RK and you bring it back. This actually doesn't always work, for example. So a bundle, which is not a vector bundle, bundle, no. vector. Uh, and okay, of course, if you take a bundle which doesn't have this as fiber and structure group, this is never a vector bundle. So what I want to do is interesting uh, because we will take a bundle with this fiber and with this structure group, but such that this additional condition is not satisfied. So we take M manifold and F. Uh, just any nonlinear diffeomorphism. Nonlinear diffeomorphism. For instance, F of X could be simply X plus one. Just really anything. So fine, but not there. Uh, continue here. Okay. So now we define a bundle, E, to just be the trivial bundle, M times R. And um, our uh, trivializing cover is just made of one open set, which is the all of them. So trivializing, 
trivializing Atlas with the map, and I have to give them up to give them two at the top left. So C, which goes from E to M and R. But we don't take the density. We take XT goes to XF of T. Yeah, so instead of sending XT to just XT, we just send X to, we send XT to X comma T plus one, let's say. And this kind of breaks everything uh, because now this is a bundle. The fiber is, of course, R. And the structure group, structure group can be taken to be R star, so R minus zero, which is simply GL one R. So. But it is not a vector bundle, but it is not a vector bundle. And the reason, of course, is because this map is not linear. Uh, so the, if you if you fix an X, this is uh, not a vector space isomorphism, but you're sending T to T plus one, and this is simply not a vector space isomorphism. However, so this concludes the sample, but I'm clearly cheating here. Uh, because sure, this gives you a bundle structure, but like, why? Why, why would you ever do this? Why, why would you ever consider something nonlinear here? In fact, if we go back to this theorem, yeah, that tells you if you have some transition maps uh, satisfying the precise condition, then you have only one bundle up to equivalent, which does this. If you follow the proof, um, the, the, the map that you're given there actually give you a transition map which work. So let me write this down properly. So the previous theorem produces Local trivialization, localization, which are linear. Are linear on fibers. Yeah, so when we define the um I think this, yeah. Well we define this local trivialization, so well, th these are linear on the fiber simply because they're basically the density. Um, and we saw that, uh, you know, once you're given this transition function, there exists, you know, the, if you, hmm, how do I say this? So if you have these transition functions here, which are given, maybe, and maybe they're not linear, right? I'm sorry, not transition, this transition function, and this gives transition function. Then you apply the theorem and you produce a new bundle, which you know by the theorem that it's equivalent to this one. But this new one is actually a vector bundle. So to, to condense this whole jabbering, let's write a lemma. So if you have a manifold and you have a bundle over it, with the uh, fiber some R to the K and structure group and structure group uh, GLK R. Then there exists another, uh, a bond. so this is just a bundle, this E, so this would be this example here. This is the E prime, which is a vector bundle over M. Which is equivalent to it. And of course, this equivalent, you mean, uh, I mean, uh, as bundles. Yeah? The sense a vector bundle in particular is a bundle. So if you start with any bundle, which has fiber RK and structure of group GLK, then up to equivalence, you can just say that this is a vector bundle. Uh, and this equivalence, of course, is an equivalent of bundle.
So now that we have this special bundles, this vector bundles, and we know that these are up to a bundle equivalent, these are just uh, um, bundles with uh, uh, fiber RK and so of GLK. I want to define something a bit more specific, which is a vector bundle morphism. M and M prime manifolds, E and E prime vector bundles over, of course, uh, M and prime respectively. A bundle morphism, bundle morphism. F. So it's still a bundle morphism. It's a vector bundle morphism. So if you recall a uh, bundle morphism, okay, you need this F to be a diffeomorphism. Uh, sorry, not diffeomorphism, just a smooth map, and also this phi to be a smooth map, and you need that everything to commute. But now we have something extra. And basically, we ask that the vector space structures are uh, preserved. So if for all of X and M, the map phi X, which we define as you should imagine, so phi is restricted to E X. So this is a map from E X to E prime of F of X. So this is this has this domain uh, simply because this is a bundle morphism. So fibers get sent to fibers, but we ask that this is a vector space morphism. Is a vector space morphism. So when we have a vector bundle, so vector space mostly means just that it is linear, yeah? So here, i.e. it is linear. So when we have a vector bundle, we have this extra structure, and basically that every fiber is a vector space. And so when we talk about vector bundle morphisms, we want this structure to be preserved. So whenever you have a morphism, you also ask that over every fiber, we have a vector space uh, morphism. Yeah. So again, a very natural definition. Um, Okay, so from here, the next topic will be the definition of principal bundle, and uh, then how principal bundles and vector bundles are related to each other. Uh, but we actually will conclude here for today, and uh, I will see you next time.